He wanted me to kill him. She's crying. What did you want to do with her? He said he couldn't spend his life in jail. Somehow or another, it popped into my mind to kill her. And so he wanted me to stab him with a knife. The voice you've just heard belongs to 14-year-old Jennifer Wirtz. In her words, she stabbed the Cherry Hill killer in self-defense. But here's the thing, it's not your typical heroic act. On October 6, 1995, police found her on the porch, but what lurked inside her house was a nightmare they never saw coming. All right, let's go back to the 90s to know the story. We're in Cherry Hill, where a 14-year-old prodigy, Jennifer Wirtz, is about to take us through. So, you've got this Cherry Hill killer on the loose, right? A real nightmare. And Jennifer, well, she's the last girl standing. But rewind a bit to 91, when her neighbor Day Day vanishes into thin air. Hold up, it gets crazier. Day Day? Yeah, she lived next door to Jennifer and that's not even the start of it. Fast forward, Jennifer's mum hooks up with this janitor dude, Eddie. Smiles all around, but you know how these stories go. Happiness is short-lived. Eddie's quirks? A bit much. But Jennifer's mom trusts him with her. Bad move. He starts all smiles and laughter and becomes part of Jennifer's family, but soon the dude goes off the deep end. Control issues and strange behavior. Jennifer, a mere seven years old, knows something's up and spills the beans to her mom, Rebecca. She spills the beans to her mom, who brushes it off like it's nothing. But she knew all that Eddie forced her to do was totally wrong. Fast forward to 95 and the nightmare intensifies. Picture cops finding Jennifer sitting like it's a casual Sunday on her porch. But inside, inside is a horror show that they didn't sign up for. The Cherry Hill Killer is still out there, and guess what? Jennifer's the one left to deal with him. And I'm like, what is happening? What are you doing? And I got really angry with my mom. Now, this is just the tip of the iceberg. So, on February 26, 1991, three years into Jennifer's ordeal at Somerset Tower, the police show up at her mom's door saying the neighbor vanished. It's Day Day, the autism therapist who came all the way from Canada to join the Elwyn Institute in Philly. And she picked an apartment on the top floor of a secured building, thinking she'd be safe. Jennifer's feeling the heat, but here's where it gets wild. The police had two suspects, both part of the maintenance team, Day Day's boyfriend, Steve Gomez, and the bizarre Charles Reddish, aka Crazy Eddie. Eddie claims he spent that night with Jennifer's mom, and Rebecca backs him up. But the prosecutor notices something. Jennifer's fear when Eddie's name comes up. Protective? You see, before the police can dig deeper, the Wirtz family vanishes, and it's not just the others bail from Somerset Tower after Day Day's disappearance. The mystery deepens when detectives find Day Day's apartment spotless. No forced entry, no blood, not a hair out of place. All they find is an $80 receipt in her date book. Even an elderly neighbor hears a suspicious thud. With no leads, the case goes cold, but it captures the nation's imagination. Jennifer, now miles away, can't shake the feeling for Day Day and her family. But Day Day's brother, Blaine Rosenberg, he wasn't buying the fact that police did everything. That's all. I wouldn't give up. I traveled to Cherry Hill 67 times. I went into local bars, local restaurants with her picture. Now, Blaine Rosenberg, fueled by an intense desire to find his missing sister, Day Day, found himself caught between his personal life and the relentless pursuit of justice. However, this dedication to Gatoll, causing his obsession to overshadow everything else, the breaking point came when his wife, confronted by the strain on their relationship, insisted that Blaine leave their home, revealing the high cost of Day Day's disappearance on his personal life. This upheaval extended to Jennifer and Rebecca, the remaining members of the family. Their move, aimed at escaping the chaos, exposed the disturbing reality behind Eddie's crazy label. Eddie, a source of unpredictability, oscillated between childlike behavior and violent outbursts, creating an unsettling atmosphere at home. 
Rebecca, though not physically harmed, became a victim of Eddie's growing anger and Jennifer, witnessing her mother's struggle, realized the untenable situation. After intense arguments, Jennifer convinced Rebecca to break free from Eddie's grip, planning a meticulous escape. Yet a crucial mistake occurred when Rebecca disclosed her plans to Eddie. The prospect of moving to Jennifer's grandmother's house, away from Eddie, brought joy, but this was shattered when Jennifer discovered Eddie, not her mother, waiting in the car on her last day of school. The ensuing confrontation set the stage for a night that would change everything. Arriving at Eddie's residence, a seemingly innocent dinner request morphed into a chilling revelation. Eddie's erratic attempts to salvage the evening escalated, claiming he needed Rebecca's car for groceries. Left alone, Jennifer urged her mother to leave before Eddie returned, but Rebecca remained steadfast. Exhausted, Jennifer fell asleep, oblivious to the impending nightmare. The night unfolded with a disturbing sound of violence as Eddie viciously attacked Rebecca. Jennifer, awakened from sleep, descended into a living nightmare. Eddie's actions, from physical violence to wielding a small hatchet, depicted the depths of his malevolence. As the night wore on, Eddie's frenzied rage escalated and the atmosphere within the residence transformed into a nightmare. In a moment of chilling brutality, Eddie unleashed a series of physical attacks on Rebecca. The room became a battleground, echoing with the sounds of punches, screams and the visceral impact of each blow. Rebecca, caught in the merciless grip of Eddie's fury, found herself defenseless against the onslaught. Now, Eddie's eyes turned towards Jennifer. Rebecca's attempt to shield herself proved futile as Eddie, consumed by madness, exhibited an unrelenting brutality. The physical and emotional toll on Rebecca was profound, her cries for mercy and pleas for release etching themselves into the haunting fabric of the night. As Jennifer witnessed her mother's suffering, a torrent of emotions surged within her. Fear, rage, and an overwhelming sense of helplessness. On a really scary night, things got very bad for Jennifer, as Eddie did some really awful things to her mum. Jennifer was so scared and begged Eddie to stop, but he didn't listen. He covered Jennifer with a sheet and she felt really scared and helpless under it. While Jennifer was under the sheet, she could hear her mom breathing, but then something terrible happened. Eddie started hitting her mom with a hatchet and Jennifer could hear the awful sounds. It was like a nightmare for her. After that, Eddie grabbed Jennifer and took her to a room where he did more terrible things to her. The whole night was filled with scary and painful moments. As the night went on, Jennifer felt broken and covered in blood. When it was almost morning, Eddie did something even scarier. He asked Jennifer to kill him or he would kill her and someone else. Jennifer, only 14 years old, had to be really brave. She talked to Eddie and convinced him not to do more harm. As the sun came up, Eddie finally listened and they went outside to wait for the police. It must have been really strange and scary for Jennifer to sit there with a the man who just hurt her and killed her mom. Later at the police station, Jennifer was still in shock. Even the police officers were surprised at how scared she looked. They questioned Eddie about what he did and Jennifer's bravery helped get him in trouble for the terrible things he had done. In New Jersey, under our law, you can't convict a person on their word alone, i.e. their confession. You have to corroborate the confession. Now, in New Jersey, a confession alone isn't enough for conviction. It needs corroboration. In 1991, police work played a crucial role. Despite Eddie's attempts to erase evidence of Dede's murder, he forgot about an ATM receipt hidden in Dede's datebook. Eddie, telling detectives about taking $80 from Dede's pocketbook, became a key piece of corroboration, especially with a Mac receipt. Jennifer's negotiation skills led to a swift guilty verdict in the final trial, earning Eddie a life sentence for Rebecca's murder and Jennifer's assault. Preparations for the second trial aimed at the death penalty for Dayday's murder. Despite legal justice, the emotional toll of losing family to murder lingered. Eddie's confession was recanted and his lawyer used false sightings to mislead the audience. The strategy aimed to portray Dayday as alive and well, having left her family. The jury needed convincing that Dayday wasn't a flighty person tired of her life. 
The angle combined with the ATM receipt succeeded, leading to Eddie's conviction. Jennifer and Blaine celebrated their victory, marking closure. In 2004, a review revealed a judge's mistake, prompting a retrial. Facing the impending abolition of the death penalty, Eddie accepted a plea deal. In 2005, Eddie was sentenced, closing a chapter that had haunted Jennifer for years. Amidst these legal battles, Jennifer rebuilt her life with family support. As a teenager, she worked hard not to let the trauma affect her. As an adult and a mother, the pain took a different form, especially in missing life events for her mother. Dede's family, without a body, may never know what happened to her. Eddie's word is all they have. To honor Dede's memory, Blaine started a foundation supporting abuse victims. Memories of Dede lived on, and Jennifer cherishes the positive moments with her mother. Anyways, in the end, what do you guys think? Do drop your thoughts in the comment section below, and we'll meet in the next episode.